personally am very honored to be standing next to you because I hear you're a bit of a baller. That's what I hear, that's the word on the streets. That's the word on the streets. Um, so she, we're gonna open this up for a Q&A, but first I have a question for you. Um, what is being human? What do you think being human is? You know, um, I think I tend to agree with my uh, colleague there that it is whatever we think about it in the context of where we're living uh, at the time. So I think it's whatever we're living like at the time is human. And that's going to change, and it has changed. I mean, if you look at it, humans or history, uh, we are different. Uh, we do different things. We walk around with cell phones. You know, that, that would be kind of weird if we saw that 100 years ago. So I think that's it. OK, so now one more thing. Um, the reason why I call you a baller is because I read a little bit about you. So I, for you folks, for folks out here that might not know exactly who you are, what you've done, what you're doing, can you just tell them a little bit about yourself? Um, well, thank you. Um, I'm a, a law professor. I'm a scientist. Um, I've had careers as a, a lawyer and a career scientist. And so I've been working with uh, law and science for a long time. And um, I guess that's where a lot of my inspiration came from, is I write a lot of scientific and technical and legal papers, but who reads those? So I thought nobody's going to really understand this unless they really see it and visually see it all play out and what the controversies are and how it's so challenging. And so I guess that, that's all my background kind of boiled into one. So do you work for the government or anything like that? Yes, I work for the government. Uh, <laughs> yeah, no, I worked uh, in the White House Science Office where we were trying to think about these science things, you know, going on uh, for the future, what we would be thinking about. And then I worked as a government lawyer, too, in the transportation and the innovative research office. So, yeah. Okay, so now I'll give her a applaud for that. That's just amazing. Amazing. So now I'm going to open up the floor for a QA. and a um, I'll just let you hold the microphone so we don't have to okay. go on that. You okay with that? Thank you. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Any questions? <laughs> yes. Uh, I was about to ask a question about how uh, <laughs> This is better. Okay. <laughs> Um, and this is a very fascinating topic for me because my background is in experimental psychology. And I was about to ask a question about uh, how uh, becoming a race cyborg uh, changes our sense of self. But then I heard you have a background in, in law. So I want to change my question to uh, uh, how technology would change uh, the concept of agency and responsibility. Uh, for example, if I have a, a computer chip in my head that helps me think and make decisions and I become this super intelligent being, but when I when my computer chip malfunctions and I make stupid decisions and I even do horrible things to other people, uh, would I be responsible or would the technology be responsible? That's my question. Hey, that's a good question. I like that. Um, you know, I'm in law school. You can uh, check that out too if you like to go to law school. Um, I think it's interesting that uh, when you talk about um, technology and law, we make analogies to stuff that already exists. And people hear the like the Supreme Court talk about a cigarette pack being like uh, a cell phone, and it makes no sense. So uh, sometimes we draw analogies from things that don't make a lot of sense. And in this case, what I would draw from to answer your question is thinking about it. what about the case where the dog uh, goes and attacks the neighbor? Are you responsible for your dog's behavior? And we have a long history, about hundreds of years of cases of that, that we are responsible for our dog because we should know what his behavior is. We have control over it and that sort of thing. 
So that's probably the first case that we would draw on. But is but and then there's the area of robotics law, and we've been asking the question: if we have a robot and it goes out and it accidentally hurts someone or a telepresence, which you know is like your presence in a a robotic body somewhere else, and you're speaking or listening through it. And what if it actually rolls over someone's foot? You know, someone's injured by your telepresence or a robot. Are you responsible for that? How much control do you exercise over it? To what degree do you have control over it? Becomes the question. But where I think your question really comes in as a real problem is when do the, when those two things merge, the machine and your brain merge together, and then they become inseparable. And then at the point where they become inseparable, you have to probably take responsibility for your actions. Um, to the extent that it's robotic, and you, uh, the question we're still grappling with is, is the programmer responsible? If the programmer programs a robot, and the robot then goes out, even in AI, and we can't re predict what AI will do, you know, if one step changes after the other in response to the environment, but to, it, but to what extent did the programmer not foresee that? Was that foreseeable? And then you might put that in a negligence context for the programmer. And that may be the, so that may be another analogy for your brain uh, machine interface. But that's a good question. And we're going to have to think about those questions. That's a good one. What if the programmer itself is a, is a machine interface? What we're seeing code writing uh, programs emerge and they do a better job than human beings. I, yeah, exactly. Um, good question. But um, to the extent that you, you assimilate that in yourself and you become that agent, I think it'll be hard to separate and then you will be responsible for it, I think. Yeah. I, I'm curious what other maybe sort of questions you might have, um, or things that can come up. Uh, a lot of this seem to revolve around personhood, just in general, and also how how the, the idea of, of not just merging our consciousness and ourselves with machines, which obviously we've done you know, quite a bit um, back in time um, shows, but um, also how um, basically bringing that to the forefront, um, I guess I'm kind of trying to understand what maybe, um, what kind of, um, epiphanies you might have had just in personhood in general in doing this film? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Um, one of the things that bothered me about, uh, one of the reasons I really wanted to do this, so I was bothered because we weren't having a dialogue about that as a group. So I think what I want to do is talk about it because maybe I don't feel confident and I know what it means. And I want to have a dialogue so we can decide as a society what this means to have maybe different people with different talents among us. And do we, do we need to, to have them as a protected class in the Constitution, um, another protected class that would have, uh, that we shouldn't discriminate against legally? And so those are the, that would be where I would be most concerned is the discrimination that might occur. And if you're talking about personhood, that's a different question. Um, were you talking about it in terms of a legal well, question? Well, legal, legally and morally, um, also, I mean, we've declared corporations persons, uh -huh. which is a very interesting thing, but also <laughs> there, we're coming up on other things that are more, you know, if it has feelings, if it, you know, like people can be declared a non-person because they have maybe a, a uh, uh, yes. um, uh, because they don't have an enhancement, or I don't know how to explain it, um, or if they're handicapped. I mean, that's exactly. not that's, exactly. Um, or they, there's something that, that's different about them, but it doesn't make them less of a person. I see. Just because somebody has more than something, maybe it doesn't make them a non person just because they are different, but they are you know, a thinking, feeling being. I don't know. Yeah, that, that, that's a good question. Um, I think the, the question is that. Uh, to what extent do you have autonomy that you don't have diminished capacity and require a legal guardian? I believe that was the, if I put that in legal terms, I think that, okay. was that, yes. that that's in a legal framework. So if you do have, um, if, if you do have some sort of an enhancement, but you're saying if you have diminished capacity, like maybe the Parkinson's in the sky or something, 
I, I just think that's interesting that the, to bring and, those in to, and people again, like you said, right. them, that they have rights, that they should not be treated like a, a, a non person just because they've made a decision or have to have certain things. Yeah, done. that's an interesting idea. Now, that's making me think about as, uh, as a community, a growing community of cyborgs that have all different problems because they have all different enhancements. Maybe there should be an advocacy group that advocates like, a, um, like an ombudsman who goes on your behalf to negotiate whatever problem you might have with, with uh, having your picture taken on the passport or something like that. Um, that might be one way to deal with all the many different uh, eccentricities that you'll have that will be, nobody will have the same enhancement, let's say. You might have a small group that has something similar, but it sounds like the way it's happening, people are really programming things to suit their needs and their their um, objectives, and so we may not have anything that's uniform that fits well in a code. So maybe having an advocacy group that could be the go-between between, between uh, members of the cyborg community and whatever the social interface is that you're having trouble with would be the way to start. That might be a good way, and then maybe at some point we'd be able to come up with a a protective legal framework for it, but that would be a good start, maybe. But that would maybe think of that. Yes. It reminds me of this, I can't recall if it was a podcast or if it was an article, but they were talking about what constitutes soup. And like, if it's a bowl full of umbrellas for a drink, cocktail, does that make it a bowl of cocktail soup? Like, is that a cocktail umbrella soup? <laughs> or if it's water with a cocktail umbrella in it, is that cocktail umbrella soup, and it just really sort of puts, like we're talking about drawing comparisons between, well, what is humanity? What does it mean to be human? And thinking about it in another context, like, okay, soup means water, does it mean bisque? Does it mean all of these things that is, I know it's sort of a strange comparison, but I feel like if we sort of take a step back, we can kind of clarify some of that. It's maybe we're all soup, <laughs> which isn't really a question. Um, but my, my real question for you is, how would you see this being different if we were in a less litigious society? Do you think that this would be more accepted or easier to um, interact with? Or what are your thoughts on that, especially being in like a litigious community? Uh, both good questions. I think your super analogy there <laughs> does make sense because we want to measure things. And we want to say, are you a half a cyborg or are you a whole cyborg? Um, so that might be one way that law might try to deal with it and say, well, if you're a half not human, then you get these set of rights. And, you, and maybe you need legal representation as either with a guardian or if you are less than a half, then you're still a human. Uh, we could come up with something silly like that, and that, that would be about right. You might expect something like that and with some uh, state statute somewhere might come up with that. And it may not work very well, but uh, we try to classify people. You know, so that might be one of the scary things that might happen, actually, is that soup, soup story. Um, the, your other question about litigious, and would we be any different if we didn't have a litigious society? Here's something that's happening that I think is really interesting, is there's a whole bunch of people who don't care about that. And this is the underground. This is where this is going. And, and as you notice this discussion of, we don't want to, we don't want to go by any rules. We just want to do it and, and see progress happen and not have to worry about that. And until uh, they start suing each other, which probably isn't likely, that's going to continue and there's going to be more of that. Uh, what I saw happening in Spain, uh, their medical procedures are things that we could not and would not do in the United States. So there are some countries that are much more flexible in experimental surgeries and things than we are. We're probably one of the toughest countries to get anything through FDA, whether it's food or whether it's drugs or devices. And one of the things that I um, was concerned about, as you know from my documentary, is the lack of the ability for FDA to understand what's going on and to, to, and to adjust their process enough to accommodate these people because they're all going underground because they can't deal with FDA. And you only, they really only have to do that if they, if they have a, something that's categorized as a device or drug which claims to do something uh, or changes the structure or function of a body under the definition of the drug and device. Um, but 
thinks that he, like an RFID, RFID chip that just opens the door isn't a medical device because it doesn't like keep track of your temperature or collect your pulse information. Once you do that, you've got a device. Um, so that's, um, would we do more if, if we weren't so litigious? Yes. <laughs> yes, we would do a lot more. Um, you will have tort lawyers, though, argue, well, we're really, we're really preventing harms from happening by being scary. You know, you can be sued for a lot of money if you do something crazy. So we're kind of guardians on that side. On the other hand, you have this tension with people who I can't, I can't feel free to experiment or do anything because I'll just get sued. Um, that's always a problem. Like this uh, in the waiver situation, um, and the story about kind of you know doing surgery if you're not a doctor. Well, actually, there's nothing really illegal about what they did, um, and it's not assault. I think they probably got that idea in the, in the other story about from malpractice cases where a doctor does something they're not supposed to do. But assault is a de by definition is an offensive touching. And you're not being, you're not offended if you ask somebody to put it in your hand, so it wouldn't really fit. But um, the, but it's interesting. There's a lot of territory that is not regulated, so uh, you can do these things. There are still a lot of things that you can do that aren't regulated. Um, so you have to keep that in mind too, you know. And maybe we like it that way. We want to be free to experiment a little bit in society without being totally uh, locked in. Um, Wait, maybe. Yes. We're, 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 we're the time schedule here, okay. so I don't mean to cut you off. <clears throat> but you're gonna, you're having a, a big thing tomorrow, right? Tomorrow, yes. Where you're gonna tell all about it, and people will be able to ask you questions tomorrow too. And she's gonna be here tonight, so you can ask her in person up close and get the real deal. But we really appreciate you coming here because that's like a big deal for us mm -hmm. and a big deal for you guys, I'm sure. Can we give her another hand? Yeah. Thank you so much. I have some more questions for you too.